What I want us to do, and what I believe we are going to do, is to establish bridgeheads on county councils up and down the country. And by that I mean, you know, we're not going to sweep the board, but if we can get groups, clusters of county councillors together, forming groups on county councils, then I think it would mark a very significant move forward for UKIP. You see, our problem is uh, that we have great support across the country, but it's very, very spread geographically. And we live under a first-past-the-post electoral system, and what we have to do if we're going to be a serious challenger in 2015 in a general election, we have to do what the Liberal Democrats did in the 80s and 90s, and that's to build up from the bottom. I suppose in practical terms, the difficulty is from the base you're starting from. I mean, you contested the county council elections, these seats uh, back in 2009. You won at that stage eight seats. That's gone up slightly with by-elections and defections. Yeah. But you won eight seats. You only won seats in the east of the country and in the Midlands. And I wonder if that says something about the spread of your support. I think, to be honest with you, so much has changed since 2009 in terms of our support uh, that I think it is very, very difficult to predict uh, where our best areas are. But I think the trend would be that the east of England looks like being the strongest part of the country for us. You say in your uh, local election manifesto, as our quality improves, so does our ability to affect change. Are you entirely sure about the quality because you're fielding 1,700 candidates, but you're a pretty small operation as a political party? I mean, can you kind of well, check all these people? Well, can you ensure? Because presumably some of them have virtually just become members comparatively recently. We, When it comes to the general election and the European elections, we have put in place a very rigorous uh, testing uh, procedure, uh, testing people's knowledge, their ability with media, you know, full credit checks, police checks, and all the rest of it. I'll be honest with you, we don't have the party apparatus in a very short space of time to fully vet 1,700 people. We have made people sign declaration forms expressing the fact that they've never been part of political parties that we consider to be wholly undesirable. By that I mean the BNP. And, you know, we ask people if there is a problem with a criminal record or wherever, whatever else it may be, please tell us. I have no doubt that amongst those 1,700, one or two people will have slipped through the net that we'd rather not have had. I mean, you've, you've already acknowledged one Susan Bowen, uh, the candidate in Tintagel, turns out to have been, yeah. uh, you say, a member of the BMP. But, I mean, she's still on your website listed as a candidate. Well, I mean, frankly, uh, what she did was outrageous because we are the only political party in Britain that says clearly when you join the party, if you've been a member of the BMP, we do not even want your membership, let alone to be a candidate. And so she deceived us. But she's still on your um, website. Is she? Well, I don't run the website. Um, she is not a candidate for us, and, she, and we've actually expelled her from the party. Fine. I, I, the reason I uh, give an example is just this kind of idea that perhaps you're, you're, sort of, you're trying to run a national political party as a cottage industry. I'll be honest with you. We are at full stretch. Uh, we are overstretched. We have a very, very small team of people, but it's a professional team. It's well run. Yes, we're going to make the odd mistake, but hey, doesn't everybody else? Let's move on to this question of your council priorities. I mean, your manifesto picks up several things that you say your councillors will do or your candidates will do if they're elected as councillors. One of them is that you want to see referenda on all key local issues. What sort of things do you think should be subject to local referenda? Uh, well, wind turbine developments would be absolutely at the top of my list, um, and that would be a good thing because every single one would get rejected. But I think housing development is the big issue. I don't think uh, that people out there are totally nimbyistic. Uh, there are lots of towns that would encourage and welcome sensible development. Uh, but the idea that whoever you vote for, for a county council election, and you finish up with your local government officers, and yet the National Planning Office could overrule you. I mean, this is something that I think needs to be exposed. And I think if we had a series of referendums up and down the country on inappropriate housing developments, we would have to get a change of national policy. So this is be uh, on a petition of 5% of the, the local population would trigger one of these referenda. It could be quite expensive, couldn't it, if every significant planning application is going to find itself well, going through this process? I think the point about this is that, uh, you know, 5% may not sound like a lot, but actually organisationally, uh, going out and getting and validating signatures for 5% of an area is not an easy thing to do. Uh, we wouldn't, I think, finish up with frivolous referendums. We, we would have them every now and again uh, when people felt that local politics wasn't reflecting their view. It's still going to cost money, though, and presumably that money would have to be fined by the council, so that's less money for services. Well, yes, holding elections, democracy does cost money. There's no doubt about that. Well, no, uh, you're having this as well as elections. Uh, well, 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 what we're proposing is real democracy, and yes, it will cost